to get to share my, uh, my thoughts on where our profession is going is such an incredible opportunity. So thank you. And I've been tasked with transitioning us to thinking ahead. We've talked about where we've come from, the history of certification over the last 10 years, some of the challenges that we continue to face, and we've started to think about the future. And so that's what, that's what I'm going to do more of today. And um, I've started with this image of an ancient ship, but given that we're thinking about the future, I want to actually move to a more modern ship and talk about the idea of a moonshot. Uh, this is a term that's thrown around a lot in Silicon Valley where I work. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with the term moonshot as it's used in tech today. Okay, a moonshot refers to, essentially it harkens back to the 1960s when in 1961, JFK set the goal of getting an American on the moon by the end of the decade. At the time, that seemed like a nearly impossible goal, but he set that goal and then NASA and the country had to go about figuring out how to get there by setting intermediate goals and small achievable goals that eventually got us to the moon in 1969. So in tech, um, moonshot projects are these kinds of projects. So projects where you set a big goal and then figure out how to get there. Google's parent company has a company called X, which is a moonshot factory. And they take on these kinds of projects. So one project that was a moonshot project that you've probably heard of is self-driving cars. Another is, um, took the goal of making the entire world connected to the internet. And it, and it developed into this project of using high altitude balloons to provide internet access in remote areas. And moonshot projects aren't unique to tech. Here's an example of a moonshot project from healthcare. Now, unfortunately, I am not here to announce that X is giving us millions of dollars to solve the problem of language access in healthcare. Oh, no. Darn it. But we can't let that stop us from thinking on this scale, right? This doesn't have to be our moonshot, but let's aim, aim high. And what I'm gonna do today is present my vision of some of the big steps that we need to take to achieve the language access portion of this moonshot. And I'll also look at some of the challenges that we face if we want to make that vision a reality. And we've already begun talking about these challenges this morning. Who am I? I am an interpreter. First and foremost, I am an interpreter. I have a master's degree in translation and interpretation, and I work as a healthcare interpreter. I'm a certified court interpreter, although I don't, I don't work in the courts and I wouldn't call myself a court interpreter. I'm a conference and diplomatic interpreter. And honestly, specializing in all of these different areas has made me stronger in all of them. I teach, I teach interpreting online and in person. I work with providers to get them to understand the importance of language access and why and how to work with skilled interpreters. And I'm an active participant and contributor in professional organizations in California and nationally. And I know this sounds like a lot. I do even have time to go on vacation sometimes. <laughs> but my heart is really in medical interpreting. I love it because I find it challenging and it's important to me to contribute to solving one of the big social problems that we face. And that is the full participation of limited English proficient people in our society. And I'm sure that everyone here feels passionate about this work too, for any number of reasons. So here we go, here's my vision. Any patient, any time, in any healthcare setting will have language access provided by highly skilled, educated, credentialed, and well-paid interpreters. Furthermore, furthermore, our profession will be highly specialized with multiple career path options. I want the field of community interpreting to be one in which people choose what they want to do, be it medical, legal, education, or interpreting in any other setting, based on their preferences and work opportunities, not pay and prestige. 
and healthcare interpreters will be understood and respected as medical professionals and as TNI professionals. Okay, these are this is a big vision. These are big goals. This is a figure from 2015. More than 25 million people in this country require language assistance. That's 25 million potential patients for us. And so we have this massive population that we're trying to serve. And 11 years ago, we had zero certified interpreters. Today, well, between the two certifying entities, we've got 6,500. Okay, we're making progress, but how do we keep growing? This is an article that was published by NPR uh, last year, and it's bringing attention to a problem. And, and yes, it's a problem, but it's actually really great that this article was published because think about it, 10 years ago, the mainstream media was not paying attention to language access in healthcare. And when we think about how to tackle this problem, how to tackle language access, and professionalizing our, and, and serving our 25 million potential patients, we can look to the past for inspiration. Does anyone know who this is? Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale, absolutely, the mother of modern nursing. In the mid 1800s, nurses were just people, mostly women, who wanted to help. Sound familiar? Sound like a few decades ago for interpreters, right? Um, and in 1855, she published Notes on Nursing, the first book about the professionalization of the field. And with her work training nurses in the Crimean War, um, the value of a professional nursing service began to become apparent. And by the late 19th century, large hospitals had established nursing training programs. By the beginning of the 20th century, Nurses had professional associations that set standards and successfully thought, sought licensing for nurses. Fast forward for, to today, we've got almost 3 million registered nurses in the United States. And they didn't stop at, at RN. Nursing is now a specialized career. There's all sorts of different specialized certificates and certifications that nurses can get, and they can get advanced degrees up to a doctorate level. So, we too have come far, right? We, we are in an ancient profession dating back to ancient Egypt. Here we have the first interpreter supposedly in the Americas, Malinche with Cortez and Moctezuma, right? Um, so it's an ancient profession, but at the same time, we're young, right? Conference interpreting, which is considered sort of the most advanced of our, of our cousins, um, is, is uh, only about 100 years old as a profession. And healthcare interpreting is what, maybe 40, right? Well, look how far we've come though in that time. Starting with the, the legislation that is the, essentially the platform on which we've built the framework for language access in the US. And in the mid 90s, we saw the first uh, working group on medical interpreting meet in Seattle. Bridging the Gap, the landmark in, uh, interpreter training program created by Cindy Rote was published, first published just in the mid 90s. We saw standards start to be developed, starting with the Massachusetts Medical Interpreting Association in 1996. Then the National Council on Interpreting and Healthcare solidified. The national class standards started to give guidance around how to apply uh, Title VI. We saw more standards of practice being developed and most importantly, national standards in 2005. 2006 was important because the Joint Commission, this regulatory agency, began to address language access as a matter of patient safety. Then finally in 2008 and 2009, we got certification. And this has continued to develop with the passing of the Affordable Care Act in 2010. So look how far we've come in just 25 years. It's not gonna take us 150 years, the way it took nursing, right? We're moving ahead, we're moving forward really fast. And one of our tasks today is to continue to think about how to accelerate that pace. So let's look a little bit at where we stand today. Um, as healthcare interpreters, we're part of the language services industry in this country, which is a $21.8 billion industry. Now, I can't tell you how much of that is interpreting or how much of that is healthcare interpreting, but that's our industry. It stands to reason that 
healthcare interpreting is the largest segment of the interpreting portion of that market though, because of the size of the healthcare industry. For comparison's sake, the entire US legal services industry in the United States is about $288 billion. That's huge. But healthcare interpreting, or I'm sorry, healthcare is the largest industry in this country with $3.5 trillion. This is what we are part of. And it's also important to think about, to, to remember who we are. I'm an interpreter who works in a hospital. And so when I think of healthcare interpreting, I think of my colleagues in a hospital. But we have to remember that we're much broader than that. Healthcare interpreters are employees of healthcare facilities and agencies, freelance interpreters, remote interpreters, and we work in hospitals, clinics, the workers' compensation system, call centers, and even at home. And yet, medical interpreting is still considered to be of lower status in the TNI community and continues to be undervalued in healthcare. What do I mean by this? Well, um, raise your hand if you've heard some variation of the following, and these are all things have been said, that have been said to me. I took some Spanish in college, so I think we can get by. <laughs> this was to a, to a child. You can do her job. <laughs> yeah. um, a nurse told me the next, uh, asked me the next question. My friend's husband just moved here and is looking for work. He doesn't speak much English. How can he get a job as an interpreter? <laughs> yeah. And here in a two hour, before a two hour information session that was gonna be interpreted simultaneously, couldn't you just summarize what I say for the patient when we finish, right? And what they're implying is, because you whispering in the back of the room is just really, is really annoying and not worth my time. And how about this one? We don't need an interpreter because we have the MA, the patient's friend, the patient's child, the resident who did a semester abroad, right? Yeah, so that's, that's still how we're seen in healthcare. And yes, this is changing and we have allies, but it's, it's still a prevailing attitude. And within the TNI community, to illustrate it, I'm gonna share with you um, excerpts from an article that was published in 2015 in the Journal of the Northern California Translators Association. This is the Northern California ATA affiliate. And the article was uh, actually a summary of a workshop that had been offered called Interpreting Success, Getting Started as an Interpreter. And it started with the premise that medical interpreting is often the place where new interpreters get started. They move on to legal interpreting and may ultimately do conference interpreting for businesses and government bodies. <laughs> and I have to say, this really, hits me here because this was my experience too. When I graduated with a master's degree and started working in healthcare, the expectations of everyone around me and my expectations for myself is that I would get started in healthcare and then I would move on and I would move up to legal and conference. Um, and it took, me, it took me several years of wrestling with why wasn't I moving on Am I scared of the court, and, court environment? Am I intimidated? And finally I realized, no, I love medical interpreting and I find it rewarding and challenging. So here's this article and in this article and in this workshop, they, the speaker talked about different areas of interpreting, medical, legal, and conference. And here are some of the words that they used to describe our field. Medical interpreting is low stress. <laughs> yeah. It's cooperative. There's an emphasis on helping others. It does, however, pay less and the work can be repetitive, okay? Legal. In legal interpreting, the market is broad. Certification is sometimes required. It's challenging and requires specialized training. And now conference interpreting. Conference interpreting gives you variety and verbal stimulation, high income, but it requires specialist knowledge and it can be stressful. So we're dealing with these myths, right? The myth that the work of the medical interpreter is easier. And the myth that the fact that medical interpreters can clarify means that we don't need to be as skilled, that we don't need to know technical terminology. And of course, the myth that our job is low stress. When we know that our job is not easier, 
However, it is true that the standards for entry are lower. Right? Less skilled interpreters can get jobs in healthcare. And the outcome is bad. We also know that a skilled interpreter does have to master technical terminology. And in fact, our ability to clarify is part of the complexity of our role. And that complexity actually makes our job harder, not easier. And while the stress, yeah, these look like really low stress work environments, right? Yeah. And so this is an example from a few years ago, but I actually can share an example from two weeks ago. I saw a, a Facebook post in an interpreter's forum where somebody posted, um, I have beginner to intermediate level Spanish and I'm interested in becoming an interpreter. What should I study? And the first response was, start by getting a job at one of the telephone interpreting companies that doesn't require certification and you'll, you can learn to interpret there. Fortunately, the next response was from somebody else that said, absolutely no way, do not do that. <laughs> Those interpreters are interpreting 911 calls, for goodness sake, go to school. <laughs> um, Holly Mickelson, who's a pioneer in community interpreting, specifically court interpreting, and she's the author of the Interpreters RX study materials, has been talking about this for 20 years. And 20 years ago, she said that essentially all interpreters are performing the same function. Yes, with different standards of practice and in different capacities, but we're all, interpret we're all performing the same function and should meet the same standards of competence. And in fact, what accounts for the disparity in working conditions and status is not the interpreting, but actually external factors that affect the market in which we work. So let's talk about some of those factors. I think that one of the most important factors is who we serve, right? Look at conference interpreting. Conference interpreting is the most prestigious branch of the interpreting profession, but that's because conference interpreters provide services for people with power. In community interpreting, in the legal, medical, education settings, we're interpreting for the same people. But an important difference in these settings is who pays the price for miscommunication, who pays the price for inadequate language access. In the legal setting, there are more opportunities for the institution itself and the players in it, like attorneys, to be held accountable for inadequate language access. In the medical setting, in theory, we have the threat of lawsuits, and we've all heard about the famous example of the $89 million lawsuit. Um, but in reality, our patients bear the, bear the brunt. Something as simple as poorly, poorly machine translated discharge instructions can lead to poor compliance with treatment, readmissions, and worse. And this rarely leads to lawsuits. Um, and it's known that, that LEP patients are often subject to more diagnostic studies, which can have a permanent effect on their health, not to mention the cost of healthcare in this country. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I overheard a physician say that because the language gap prevents us from fully ass assessing mental status, we should go ahead and do a head CT. What they should have said was, because we didn't call an interpreter until the patient had been in the emergency room for half an hour, <laughs> we're going to do a head CT. And these things have real consequences, and these examples are really just the tip of the iceberg. And the status of our patients likely affects our status in the medical center, too. We know that there are massive health disparities that minorities face. And not only are our patients LEP, many are immigrants, many are racial minorities, many are poor, they're on Medicaid. And in some, some populations, we're dealing with people with lower levels of education than the average American. So we have this disempowered LEP population which contributes to our lower status in the TNI community and it contributes to us being undervalued in healthcare. And all of that contributes to a myriad of problems, including insufficient training for healthcare interpreters, low rates of certification, a, a shortage, a shortage of skilled healthcare interpreters, low wages, broad use of ad hoc interpreters, family members, friends, hospital employees with no interpreting training. The low requirements for entry, 
And of course, of course, all of this together and more mean decreased quality of care for LEP patients. So how do we raise the status and standards of healthcare interpreting? I'm going to share with you some of my ideas on some of the stakeholders that we need to work with and some of the challenges that we need to address to raise our status and therefore improve the quality of care that our patients are receiving. And a lot of these, a lot of these ideas have already been shared this morning, but we're going to try to bring them together and see what we can do. Starting at the top, policy and advocacy. Regulations dr can drive change in practice. I remember when the Joint Commission first recognized language access as an issue of patient safety. In my hospital, we were able to use this to get uh, the risk management department on, on board as one of our biggest allies. And that's changed the way we work in our hospital. Um, Mara talked, explained beautifully the importance of interpreters on the ground understanding policies and the implications of policy change, right? It affects both our direct work with our patients, but also the administrative po policies that affect us. So for example, we're seeing a trend now towards increased use of VRI instead of OPI. And I think most of us would agree that this is a positive trend. But if uh, ACA section 50, 1557 is changed to no longer include that, what will happen? What will administrators decide to do? What will policies be? And there are some policies that exist that we can use to our benefit, but we have to do the work to explain why these policies really have to do with language access. So for example, the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems Program um, ensures or rewards hospitals for receiving positive results on patient surveys. And with the hospital readmissions reduction program, hospitals can lose Medicare funds if their readmission rate is too high. So we know that language access can influence readmission rates, that it influences patient satisfaction, but we need to help administrators make that connection. And as, as Mara said, we're in a pretty tough national climate for language access policy and immigrant rights policy in general. And so I think what we need to do is work on the state level, at least for the next couple of years. Because when, it, when a critical mass of states changes policy, it de facto becomes national practice. Right? I also think that it is important for us to work with our interpreter associations Right. As individuals lobbying, we don't make a huge impact, but if we work with interpreter associations who represent interpreters, not just representing the language industry, but actually representing the interests of interpreters, I think we can be more effective. Medical academia, medical schools, we need to get medical schools on board as our allies in two key areas. Number one, medical education. How do providers know how to use an interpreter? Right? We do most of our teaching of providers on the fly on a daily basis, but why aren't we attending their conferences? Why aren't we working with medical schools and actively training medical students on how to work with interpreters? Um, some medical students do, some medical schools, excuse me, do recognize the importance of teaching medical students how to communicate with LEP patients. And they may, even involve, they may even create standardized patient scenarios for them to practice with, with LEP patients. So these are, are when actors come in and they play the part of a patient and the medical student has to interview them and they get to practice essentially their skills. Um, but I know of at least one medical school that does this and the interpreters for these encounters are bilingual actors who are not trained to interpret. So they're teaching, supposedly teaching them to work with interpreters, but they're not actually teaching them to work with interpreters, right? Uh, there was a pilot done at Yale a few years ago, and if anybody is here from Yale, I'd love to talk to you and find out what happened after this. Great. Um, but in this, in this study, they did standardize patient encounters, 
and they actually invited certified medical interpreters from the medical center to interpret in the encounters. So this is an important step in the right direction. Another example, also from Yale, uh, was a change to the medical school curriculum in which in the first two weeks of medical school, students would make the rounds with nurses, dietitians, chaplains, interpreters, and social workers in the hospital. So this is fantastic because it's teaching medical students from day one that interpreters are professionals and are part of the team. Right? This is the sort of thing we need more of and that we need to be advocating for it. And I know that getting even FaceTime with medical education directors in medical schools is really challenging, but the more we professionalize, the more we prove ourselves to be colleagues, the better chances we have. We also need to work with medical researchers. Right? Um, and I don't, and, I, and we have, there, is, there is internal industry research that's been, that's been great, but that's not the sort of thing that is gonna really sway physicians and hospital administrators. They want data that's published in medical journals. And most research about language access in those journals is research about interpreters, not by interpreters. We are the subjects of research and not research partners. In fact, I have a friend who, is, who advises medical students on how to do research. And a few weeks ago, a student came to her with a proposal for a project that he wanted to do, looking at language access in the PICU, in the pediatric hospital. And her first question was, well, have you talked to interpreter services about being a research partner on this study? And he said, oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. So this is not someone with ill intentions. This is somebody who cares about language access. He wants to do a research project on it, and it didn't even occur to him that interpreters could be his colleagues, his partners in this project. Yeah. Here's a particularly poor example of research on language access, and um, it's from 2006, and I understand that at the time, this medical center had no professional interpreters, right? We've changed a lot in the last 13 years. Um, so hopefully this type of res result wouldn't be published today. But this study started with the premise that the presence of an interpreter leads to less satisfactory communication with physicians. Not language barriers, but the presence of the interpreter. Okay. And in fact, they proved that speech was significantly reduced and revised by the interpreter, and therefore the presence of an interpreter increases the difficulty of achieving good physician-patient communication. Well, when we dig into the methods of this study, we see in addition to the n equals 2 and n equals 11, we see that in all of the interpreted examples, interpreters were either family members or nursing and office staff. So this combining, essentially, of ad hoc interpreters and professional interpreters happens a lot in the research. And it means the research isn't really accurate or valuable. Um, now, that doesn't mean there isn't good research out there. In fact, this is one of my favorite studies, and Dr. Glenn Flores has done a lot of really fantastic research on health disparities and language access, including this 2005 study published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. And in this study, they found that, um, as we would expect, professional interpreters committed fewer errors of clinical consequence than ad hoc ones, but also that interpreters with over 100 hours of training, not experience, training, made significantly fewer errors than interpreters with less training. This is the kind of research that we need to continue. This is big. This tells us that 40 hours is not enough, right? And in fact, 40 hours teaches you about interpreting, but I would argue that it can't teach someone to interpret. And there are other more modern, more, more modern studies that have been published um, that are, have quality language access research, including publications that are starting to actually involve interpreters or people who work with interpreters and understand our role. So here, here's an example with two of the authors of this study are directors of interpreter services at, um, at, at hospitals in this area. And imagine how excited I was to see this. Yay. And actually, I understand that Vanessa and Fernando are here. So kudos to you. Thank you 
for this great work. Please keep it up. Market research. As a still maturing profession, one of the pain points that we face is a lack of data. How many interpreters work in healthcare? How many, how about how many dual role interpreters? What, if any, is the average pay differential for certified versus non-certified interpreters? How much does it cost to not provide good language access with professional interpreters? We don't know, we have anecdotal evidence and we have ideas, but we don't actually have these numbers. And these are things that are hard to study and take a lot of money to study. The last, um, the last bona fide publicly available market study of the interpreting industry in the United States was, is almost 10 years old. It was done by, it was done by Interpret America uh, or commissioned by Interpret America in 2010. So how can we advance our profession if we can't even define who we are and where we work? Right. Now, it's not that there's nothing. In, rec there, there, in recent years, there have been, there've been important developments, starting with the job task analyses that the certification entities have done. Um, the American Translators Association does a translation and interpreting services survey. Uh, the last one was published in 2016. And market research entities like NIMSI, Common Sense Advisory, and Slater are doing some of this work, but there's still so much we don't know. Um, and in the spirit of it's important for us as on-the-ground interpreters to keep ourselves informed, in addition to following those immigrant rights and healthcare law organizations, I suggest checking out these entities as well. Certification. Certification, certification, certification. It's already been said several times this morning that, that, that credentials give us a role. Certification gives us a role in the healthcare setting. Having letters after our name means we belong and this is my place and I'm your colleague, right? Um, and for me, coming, coming out of the academic background that I came from, credentials felt like the obvious thing to do, right? I, I graduated with a master's degree in conference interpreting and that's a credential for that field. And so, and then I got my credentials, my, my certifications for, course in, for court interpreting. And so when medical certification be, became available, I got certified because of course, that's what you do. But so many of our colleagues don't get that, right? So many of our colleagues will only get certified when certification is required by law, by their employer, et cetera, or when there's some sort of incentive to get certified, right? Like maybe more money. So we need to challenge ourselves to think about how to get our colleagues to understand why certification is so important. For one thing, certification is linked to money, right? Um, let's look at federal court interpreters. This is, these are the um, daily rates for contract court interpreters in the federal court system. Certified interpreters are paid almost, are, are paid actually more than twice as much as non-certified interpreters. And within the ASL community, and again, there's not a lot of data out there. This is my informal survey of some ASL interpreter colleagues in California. Freelance ASL interpreters in California make $65 to $100 an hour when they're certified and only $35 to $60 when they're not. We also know that medical interpreting is generally less well remunerated than court interpreting for, for spoken languages. And a big part of that is the fact that court interpreting is a certified profession where most people need certification. I don't, again, have figures about average salaries for healthcare interpreters that are particularly reliable. The Bureau of Labor Statistics looks at our industry as a whole, all interpreters and translators, and comes up with a figure of a median salary of just under $50,000 a year. But this information is really not very useful to us because it lumps all of us together, right? Translators, localizers, interpreters in all different areas. Um, but hopefully, as we continue to grow, as we continue to mature, 
we'll begin to see more detailed analysis at this level. All right, so what are our goals for certification? I already said we need to get more people certified. Right? And it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario, right? What comes first, requirements for certification or a critical mass of certified interpreters? And so this is something we have to work on from all sides. We need to lobby uh, at the state level. We need to lobby within our hospitals, uh, in hospital administrators. We have to lobby the language service providers to get them to see the value of certification and pay certified interpreters more. And we need to work on a grassroots level to explain to our coworkers why certification means something. And by the way, earlier it was mentioned that one of the benefits of certification is continuing education. And I agree with that 100%. It can also be a barrier because we have people working in our field who see this as just a job and they don't wanna go through the hassle of getting certified because then it means they have to deal with the hassle of going to conferences and of learning. Right? And that's something that we have to overcome. And it's, yeah, it's financial as well. What else? It's also been mentioned that we need full certification, including an oral test of interpreting proficiency, to be available for more languages, for many languages, for 500, lang well, 300 languages, let's say. Um, but to get that, we need to get more interpreters interested in taking an exam, and it takes money. So imagine. What if states with high populations of speakers of certain languages recognized the value of certified interpreters and designated public funds to assist with the creation of exams in those languages? Is that something that we can aspire to? Maybe, right? And in the meantime, because we're not going to get certification from a handful of languages to 300 languages overnight, finding interim solutions to test the skills of languages for which we don't have an oral exam or currently have a, an oral exam in that language is, is really important. And the EDE project is so exciting. This is real research asking an important question. And if they manage to show that you can test interpreting skill through a same language to same language exam, it's a game changer throughout our entire industry, not just healthcare interpreting, and it will be something to celebrate. Yeah. Raising the bar. We need to make the entry level exam for, for certification of healthcare interpreters more challenging. Right? A cred credential is only worth something when the people holding it demonstrate high level of skill. And it's perfectly normal for exams to change. In fact, CCHI regularly changes their exam, but in all professions, certification exams change to reflect the realities of the, of the profession. Medical license exams, bar exams, et cetera. And they change to reflect evolving understandings of the challenges of the job, so they can change in level of difficulty. They change to reflect content matter. Um, currently, the consortium exam, which is the uh, court interpreting exam that's used by many states, is talking, there's, there's debate about adding civil law content because of changes in law in many states that are now requiring professional certified interpreters for civil proceedings, which they didn't before. Um, and changes can also be made to reflect evolving technologies and with the evolution of testing technologies, right? There, uh, I think it was Aaron who mentioned, well, how do we test for encounter management skills? We don't have a good answer to that now, but maybe one day we will. And if we do, that would be fantastic. With certification, we also need to think beyond the basic certification. Think about nurses. Nurses are not just RNs. Nurses can specialize in any number of fields. Um, so let's have interpreters be able to get advanced and specialized certifications. Mental health interpreters, pediatric interpreters, workers' compensation interpreters, and on and on and on. education providers, and this was mentioned on the, last, on the last panel, there are only a handful of degree programs, of four-year and advanced degree programs in interpreting in the United States. And I'm not aware of, or at, at the MA level, most, most of them focus on conference. And the only PhD program that I know of in the United States for interpreting is um, at Gallaudet for ASL interpreters. 
And we currently have a scaffolding in the com at the community college level. We're seeing more and more associate's degree programs and year-long certificate programs in interpreting, and that's an important start. But if we want to be taken seriously as a profession, we need to increase the offerings for four-year and advanced degrees. The most, the most programs that we have are for Spanish interpreters, um, and we need to continue to grow programs for languages other than Spanish. Another positive trend that we're seeing is the development of scholarships. Language uh, service providers and language access companies are starting to provide scholarships for uh, students to enter the field and to go to school, and this is an important step forward that we should continue to push for. And internships. This is really important to me personally. I would not be here if it were not for an internship. When I was in graduate school, I thought I was going to be a conference interpreter. And I mean, I am, but I thought I was going to be only that. And um, when I was looking for an internship between my first and second year, the only thing, the only interpreting internship I could find was in a hospital. And thank goodness for that internship, because I realized what an incredible career this is. And I fell in love with it. So offering the creation of internships, um, the creation of internships is a really important tool for getting skilled interpreters into our field. And academic institutions are not just going to create programs because we say they should. The Middlebury Institute of International Studies didn't, offering, didn't offer medical interpreting as an elective until just a few years ago, and that was in response to student demand. Finally, with regards to education, we need to teach for the market. Interpreting classes teach in-person, face-to-face interpreting. But where we're seeing the most growth in our market is in remote interpreting. So we need to see training standards and training programs that actually address the issue of remote interpreting because it's different. All right, technology. Remember the scope of the challenge? We've got 25 million people. We're in a $3.5 trillion industry, right? It's massive. And this, this scope demands a multifaceted solution. That solution, of course, includes in-person interpreters, but it also includes remote interpreters. Right? It includes dual role interpreters, and it might even include a role for AI for mobile apps. I know that sounds really scary. It hurts me a little bit to say it, but think about how many patient encounters take place every day. When I'm working in the hospital and I see the same patient four or five times, that's a lot of contact that I've had with that patient on that day. Think about how many encounters that patient is having every day with hospital staff, dozens. And maybe some of those encounters are, are um, the communication takes place through telephone interpreters, but a lot of that communication doesn't. A lot of it takes place through perhaps uh, trying to speak the language, it takes place through uh, language cards, it takes place even through apps. And it's a scary thing for us to talk about, but if we don't talk about it, it's going to happen anyway. And it will happen indiscriminately. So we as interpreters, as language access experts, need to have a hand in the development of best practices and provide our hospitals with guidelines. Right? If we don't do this, we're not going to have a say in how it happens. And let's talk about remote interpreting. This is data from um, two academic medical centers in an urban area with a large LEP population and robust interpreter services departments. And they both provide about 25% of their service in person. Um, Hospital B uses mostly vendors. However, those vendors are trained in-house. They receive a hospital badge. They're essentially, they're essentially the same as, as staff. Hospital A has an internal VRI service that covers about 12% of the demand. And Hospital B uses a vendor for video remote interpreting that covers about 25%. And then both rely primarily on vendors for OPI. And when we look at this, we see that even in these hospitals, 
that are well resourced, that understand the importance of language access, well over half of the encounters in those hospitals take place with remote interpreters provided by vendors. So this doesn't mean that, oh, they just need to work harder to get 100% in person. That's not gonna be the reality, right? The reality is remote is here to stay. And what we need to be talking about is what are best practices in remote interpreting? Right? So what are best practices in remote interpreting? Um, I think that an important, uh, I, think, I think that one valuable tool that isn't possible everywhere, but that when it can be used, should be, is the idea of insourcing. Having your own staff do the video interpreting. It makes efficient use of their time, and they're the people that are familiar with the institution, and it makes it easier to control quality. So Stanford Healthcare has a completely closed system, right? Only staff interpreters interpret via video, and when staff interpreters aren't available, it rolls over to an OPI vendor. And the Healthcare Interpreters Network is such a cool model because it really allows hospitals to leverage their staff and share resources in a creative way. So the interpreters are able to interpret on video for their own institutions. They're there so they can go and interpret in person. If they're not available, their uh, colleagues from partner institutions can step in. And so this really enables them to be much more efficient and maintain quality standards. We also need to be talking about best practices um, in terms of standards for video remote interpreting. VRI is hard, right? I do it once a week and it is hard. I'm exhausted at the end of the day and it's hard and it's different. And yes, a lot of it is the same, but there are different skills involved, especially those encounter management skills that we know are so crucial in our field. And we need standards for training. On VRI. And finally, a key element in all of this is unity within the interpreting community, unity with our colleagues, right? First of all, while our internal differences are important, the differences between court interpreting and medical interpreting and education interpreting, yeah, that's all important, but the rest of the world sees us as one. And so if somebody has a good experience or a bad experience with a healthcare interpreter, they're gonna take that and, and their attitude towards their court interpreter is gonna reflect it, right? We are, we are one, and so we need to act like it. And frankly, we're facing a lot of the same challenges. We're facing challenges of technology, uh, changes in the law, market pressures that often feel like a race to the bottom. And by the way, I wanted to mention, um, when I talked about remote interpreting, in, as a hospital interpreter, I know that we tend to think of the OPI interpreters as that other service. And when, when there are concerns about the quality of that other service, it's, oh, that other service. They're serving our patients. They are us. And so we need to bring OPI and VRI interpreters into our world, we are, we, are, we are one. And so the fight to improve working conditions and pay and standards for those interpreters is something that we all need to care about. One of the ways that we can become a stronger com interpreting community is by sharing what we know and by sharing the challenges that we faced. So, from healthcare interpreting, what can we share? Well, we're still uh, just getting started with VRI, but we're miles ahead of VRI in other areas of interpreting. So we can share our lessons learned and the pitfalls to help our colleagues avoid making some of the same mistakes. We're also ahead in language inclusion. We're also behind in language inclusion, right? But Healthcare interpreting offers the most training opportunities for languages other than Spanish. We still need more, we need lots more, but we've made more progress than our colleagues in other areas. And what can we learn from our colleagues? There's lots we can learn, but I'm gonna share my uh, key takeaways. I think from conference interpreters, 
we can take the professional pride and accountability. Right? Conference interpreters are proud to be highly skilled. And almost every conference interpreter is highly skilled because if you're not, you're not gonna last in that career, right? They're proud of what they do and they hold each other to high standards. For our ASL interpreter colleagues, I think we can take the importance of an empowered patient population. The ADA has more teeth than regulations regarding spoken languages, right? And that empowers the deaf community and in turn empowers ASL interpreters to both fight for their patients, but also to fight for themselves, for their working conditions, for their pay, for their standards. And what can we learn from court interpreters? From court interpreters, we can see the value of seeing ourselves as language professionals. Right. And I'm not necessarily talking about the people in this room, but there are a lot of interpreters in healthcare who think of interpreting and think of language as a tool that they have that helps them work in the environment that they want to work in. Maybe because they're interested in medicine, maybe because they care so deeply about their community that they want to help, but language is not their priority and they're not thinking about language and working to improve their skills. And court interpreters see themselves as language professionals first. And I think, I think that that is a lesson that we can take from them. So remember that Holly Mickelson quote about the disparity in working conditions for interpreters not being due to the nature of the interpreting but to external factors? She goes on to say that the only way to overcome these disparities is through unity. I don't have to tell you that public policy is determined as much by who has power as by who's right. We only have power if we work together as a profession and in alliance with organizations in our community that care about safe communication and healthcare and immigrant rights. That's what we have to do to get what we need for ourselves as professionals and above all, for our patients who deserve respect and care. We can do it, we just have to aim high. So thank you to CCHI for being one of the forces that brings us together and challenges us to do that. And I can't wait to hear from everyone else about your visions of what we should aspire to this afternoon. Thanks. I would like to thank Johanna for this wonderful and inspiring keynote. And I will just be transparent and I tell you I met Johanna when she came to Stanford Healthcare for her internship and we worked together and it's been an amazing journey. So thank you. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs>
how do I get more information? This is how you can contact us for a free demo.